let me record this. We are, I got 14 total, okay? You're my third, you're, you're number 13, and I got John Spar, number 14. And these things, these stories are gonna be wide and varied, which is what I want. I got, you know, I got STNAs, I got nurses, I got New York City nurses, I got coroners, right. I got Trinal Home people, so it's a wide variety of people. And we're gonna have the unveiling of the artwork on May 18th at the Ritz Theater from 12 to 2. If you can make it, that's great. I'd love to have you there to see the artwork and get, you know, meet your artists. But if you can't make it, I'll send you an invite and everything else. If you can't make it, um, we'll have it by Zoom also. Okay. I'd like to have your your officers there, though, your commanding officer, either on Zoom or in person. That'd be great to see that. Because I want, I want the community to recognize what you guys are doing for us. And I think it's critical for, for that to happen. I'm gonna have about 30 companies from Tiffin there, one person each, because I want the people of Tiffin to recognize what's been going on here that we have not seen. And that's critical. So I want them to go back to their companies and say, you know what I just heard today? And then get that word spread that way. That's the goal, okay? All right. Okay, all right. So first of all, when you, when you when, let's go back to the pandemic when it started. When did you first hear about it? What was your first reaction? Uh, so the, the week that the pandemic really started, uh, just so happened to be uh, a week I had my National Guard drill weekend that week. Okay. And I left Tuesday morning to go down to uh, Fort Knox and everything was normal. Uh, there, there wasn't even much mention of COVID other than, you know, what was going on over in, in China. This was uh, March was or February? What, what, what month is this? March or February? Say that again? What month was this? February or March? Uh, March. Okay. All right. Uh, March, I want to say it was uh, the, the teen weekend, maybe the, the first weekend in the, the no, it was a, the teen weekend. Okay. Um, and there, there was barely a, a mention of COVID in the news. Uh, I went to drill Tuesday morning. We were down in the woods of Fort Knox uh, through Saturday that weekend. And you know, out in the woods at Fort Knox, we didn't have much cell service. Uh, there was a couple moments where I remember checking my phone and seeing an email uh, from Capital University because I was taking some, some grad classes there saying classes are moving to remote and classes were going to be shut down for the week except for classes that were already online. Uh, and, and I, by the time I got home Sunday night that weekend, it was, uh, just a little bit after 9 PM and the bars were already closed. Wow. And, and so when I went to drill, it was, you know, situation normal. And then when I got home from drill, it was like the world was turned upside down and you couldn't go anywhere you couldn't do anything and then the, the stay at home order ensued shortly thereafter it had to be a shock it had to be such a shock to you i mean from normalcy to nothing right right um, and and so within a, a couple of weeks i knew some of the national guard had been called up for covid relief i didn't even know what they were doing at that point um and then about a, a month later, April 20th, is when I started active duty uh, to support the, the food banks. Uh, when I first came on in, in April, I was the officer in charge at the Toledo Northwestern Ohio Food Bank, uh, obviously in Toledo. Um, and we had, oh, I don't know, approximately 30 30 soldiers, 25 to 30 uh, soldiers at that point that were working in the food bank, replacing uh, the volunteers that that weren't, couldn't be at the food bank or wouldn't be at the food bank uh, to support it. Um, the food banks primarily run on, on volunteers as a not-for-profit organization. Right. Um, and most of their volunteers are elderly, retired folks that, that are in that at-risk category that couldn't leave their homes or wouldn't leave their homes out of uh, just the sensibility of, of everything. Um, and so the food banks would have shut down if, if General Harris, uh, the adjutant general for the state of Ohio, 
and said, yes, we can we can pull in some National Guard to help keep these uh, critical infrastructure organizations like food banks open. Hang on, uh, just, hang on, just so <laughs> just so I can I can grasp this now. The food banks were running fine with the volunteers. COVID hits. They recognize that volunteers are at risk group. Somebody makes a phone call to someone, and that, that phone call ends up at the general's office. And the general says, "Okay, we'll we'll step in where we have to." So that decision yeah. was made within a month or so after the COVID, after the after the crisis was in full in full uh, scale. Or that that's a critical that's a critical decision. I mean, you, you got to keep the food banks open at, at this time, especially is more important than anything because you can't get right. food anywhere. Yep, because because at that point we had we were I think we were still under the stay at the home order. Yeah. Uh, except for critical essential workers, um, and and so I mean the we we've, we've had issues with food insecurity before the pandemic, and it was only heightened because now you know this family mom and dad are both without a job and they're still trying to provide for two or three kids or however many kids. And they just lost their income. Yeah. Well, so if, if you lost your job and now you don't have money to go buy food, well, and the food banks aren't getting volunteers, that means the food banks aren't giving food to the people that need food. And, and we have people that would literally starve. So the need was increased to keep them open more, the, more so than ever before. And the ability to keep them open on a regular basis was no longer there. So you had two compounding factors, a huge a exponential increase in need and a, a huge loss in terms of workers. Holy cow, I didn't think about that. Wow. Yep, and, and so they actually, uh, the government waived the requirement for, uh, for the clients receiving food. The government waived the requirement to uh, verify their income or verify their need. Um, cause it used to be basically you could only get food from the food bank if you qualified for food stamps or welfare. Right. Uh, but because of the pandemic, I mean, you might've made a million dollars last year, but if you lost your job back in March, you're, you're, you're out of luck. Right. Because okay. even if you made a million dollars, that doesn't mean you were smart with your money. And, and actually saved up for a time when you might not have a job. And who would have anticipated a <laughs> pandemic like this, cutting everything, shutting everything down, everything down? Yep. And and you know what? People that make more money typically spend more money. Yep. And so, you know, if you had a low income and then you lost your income, well, okay, you might only be like three hundred dollars short of of your expenses. But if you were making a million dollars and you lost your income. <laughs> Well, you're looking at, you know, maybe a thousand dollar a month house payment, or a, you know, eight hundred dollar a month car payment, or you know, whatever other expenses you have. When you're used to spending that much, now when you don't have that money, it piles up even quicker. Yeah, the delta is huge when you're looking at the losses involved in this. Yep. So, so, so need need is relative, I think. I agree. Uh, to relative to what you had before you were in need. So when you had your 30 guys underneath you, the first meeting you had, what was what was the what was the 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 tone like of the group there and what did you say to them? I mean they all they're all trained for this kind of thing, but still to me a civilian, what was be, what was said, how was it how was the how was it approached? Well so actually we're we uh, as the National Guard had never been trained on how to set up a public distribution site for people to come get anything from us, whether food or water or, or any of that. Uh, we did have some uh, of the Ohio Military Reserve um, as part of the State Defense Forces, which, which falls under the purview of uh, General Harris, the Adjutant General. Um, and, and they train on logistics. Okay. Um, it, it, the, the Ohio Military Reserve is, is more or less a militia type organization, That's uh, right. but they, they do nothing combat related. They are purely sustainment and logistics. Um, and, and they actually do training uh, that falls under FEMA's purview. Okay. Uh, um, uh, incident management type training. And, and one of the things that they train on is points of distribution or pods. 
Okay. Uh, it's uh, essentially how to how to manage a distribution site where okay we've got a parking lot we've got a, a product type whether food water you know cases of MREs what have you um, and how you flow people into the parking lot maintain safety uh, and then flow them out uh, with getting everybody what they need but then you know if you need to resupply the food line or or you know just swap out workers. They, they do that kind of training on their drill weekends with the Ohio Military Reserve. You know what? Uh, I, had, I had five soldiers from the Ohio Military Reserve at the food bank. Did um, you know that they existed before this? Say that again? Did you know that they existed before this? Did, they, did you know that they, that, that group was out there? Uh, I knew that they were out there, but I've, I've never had any interaction with them. Um, and there's, uh, and, and this mission has totally changed my mind on it. Um, but it used to, to be kind of like, uh, oh, you know, they weren't, they weren't good enough to be, to be real soldiers. So they, they, they joined an alternate organization. Uh, but the, the skill set that they bring to the table far and above what I think any national guardsman expected if they didn't actually know who they were or what they did. Um, wow. I, I mean, I, I attribute much of my success to the, to those five, uh, Omar Ohio military reserve soldiers, uh, because that, that's what they did. They, they trained on drill weekends, um, for doing these kinds of things and they've responded to some incidents, uh, in the past. Like I know a couple of years ago, there was the, uh, tornadoes down, I think around the Dayton area. Yeah. And I know they had set up uh like the a reception facility for volunteers that were coming in and, and assigning you know responsibilities to volunteers um they've been involved in some of that kind of stuff uh but i think this might actually be the first time in ohio's history that they have deployed with the old ohio national guard both army and air wow. uh, so so it really was a, a joint effort and the fact that they knew how to do this, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, most of the most of the, the men and women that were at the food bank with me, the, the soldiers and airmen, um, we don't train on logistics. Uh, most of most of them are actually part of the the infantry brigade combat team that we have here in Ohio, the, the 37th Brigade. And we train for combat. That's that's what we do. We're an infantry unit. We we train for combat. So to call us up for active duty and say, hey, you're not even gonna carry weapons, you're just gonna go hand out food. But we we didn't know what we were doing. Right? But the military is a, a professional organization and and we adapt to whatever the situation is. Yeah. Um and, and I, I attribute the ease of our adaptation into this situation for this mission to the Ohio Military Reserve that we had with us because they already knew what they were doing. Like, I'm, I mean, granted, I, I stepped in about a month into the mission, but when I got there, they were still figuring out from the food bank side of things how to actually run a distribution. Uh, those both getting the food out there and the actual logistics of, of running the distribution itself. So, so how, here's a, so let's, let me start from the, from, from scratch with that. Um, we're, we're given the fact that everything's shut down and you can't get donations anymore or hardly any donations because people are so much in need. Where's the food come from? And demand is higher and yet the food's not going to be there available. Will it? So actually there was an increase in donations. Really? Uh, because because when the the bars and restaurants were shut down those restaurants already had orders put in for for the next week or the next two weeks and that food still showed up but then the restaurants had no need for it i mean sure yeah some of the restaurants were doing carry out and you could order order and, and do carry out but the restaurants weren't using the amount of food that they had ordered okay and and the only way to just not throw it out for them to make good use of it was to then donate it to the food banks. Wow, I never thought about that. Holy and, cow. 
So there, there was actually an increase in donations, uh, especially in the first like two months. Wow. Um, and so we actually had enough food coming in, and then, and then a couple months in, uh, the uh, I believe it was the FDA had had authorized some emergency uh, relief to farmers and the agricultural community, and and put together like. Uh, a variety produce box with you know a couple a head, of, a head of lettuce or cabbage, couple summer squash, couple zucchini, um, you know bell peppers, and and we got these shipments of, of produce boxes um, that uh, I mean we would get truckloads, and then we would give the the fresh produce out you know, along with you know your typical shelf stable uh, kind of kind of boxes. So walk me walk me through a day when you would show up and, and the like the busiest day and the, and the best day. Walk me through how this works because I I have no idea how this would work. Um, well, it, I mean it's different everywhere we went. I mean the food bank covers uh, eight counties across Northwest Ohio. Okay. Um, ranging all the way from the the Indiana border all the way over uh, uh, like the Port Clinton area. Um, so approximately half the state, east to west, uh, and just that, that eight county area. And, and we went to all eight counties and, and distributed food. So each one was a little bit different. I mean, there was some where, you know, we would only serve 100 families, uh, but there's been some distribution. Um, and, and it all just depended on where we were at, what day it was. Uh, and you know, it even depended on the weather. <laughs> so you went. So you took the food to the to the people, or took the food to a central location in those eight counties. So we would we would set up a site in each of those counties and bring the food out there uh, and advertise it. We would reach out through some of the the news channels, through uh, some of the radio stations, put it on Facebook. Um, we would with a with a local county level agency um whether it was uh that's the uh northern ohio uh community action something um so whether no cac or uh of God at, a, at a county facility um we reached out to some churches that have that we were looking to go to and said, hey, can we use your parking lot? And hey, do you mind you know, posting on your Facebook or getting on your, your city's Chamber of Commerce page and, and posting out there? And the local uh, agencies or organizations to advertise those for us. Just because, you know, someone out in Bryan, Ohio, isn't going to watch the Toledo Food Bank page. Right. Because you know, ninety percent of what what the Toledo puts on their Facebook page isn't about Bryan, Ohio. Right. So we had to try and reach the the local agencies and organizations that actually already had a a rapport or a relationship with the people that live there. So how did you set up these things up then? Given the fact that you got trained by the uh, militia, I mean, what was what was the logistics like? You had you had your entrance and exit, and you had guide people through and then you had things already set up to give them or well so so one of one of my responsibilities as the officer in charge is the i would help the food bank find a site and and collectively we would contact the site get approval to go there uh start looking at a at a date to get out there and then i would look up their address on google maps and look at you know, just the general layout of their, their parking lot. And, and then if time allowed, I would drive out to that site, you know, like a week before the distribution and actually look around to get a better idea of how big the parking lot was, where the entrances were, where the exits were, um, and, and just formulate a plan for, okay, if we let the cars come in this side of the parking lot, you know, we form lines here and then we put the, the truck with all the food here and then they drive through and then exit there. And, and we would set up cones, we would bring some, some signs with us and then it would get advertised and we would show up that day and, and we would do it. 
Well, what's no, a, what, it was, it was a, a very fluid process. Um, that uh, I mean, what the actual distribution looked like totally depended on on where we were. It was very site specific. What was your um, busiest day? I mean, how many how many boxes did you hand out? How many cars did you see? Or how do you rec how do you recognize the fact that you had a busy day? Uh, again, it really all depends. I, I mean, I, I could tell a difference when we went back to the same site over and over, there would be less people on a day that it was raining. Okay. Even though it was 70 degrees and they're sitting in their cars, right? So, so at a distribution, the, the cars would pull in, we would open their trunk, we would load the food, we would close their trunk and they would drive away. They didn't get out of the car for anything. But yet, if it was raining, they didn't want to sit in their car in line. <laughs> or they didn't want to unload it in the rain at their house. Yeah. I, uh, so, I mean, what, what meant a busy day for us was if, um, and, and we, we tried pre-registering families. They could call the food bank or register online. Um, so we would have a ballpark idea of, of how many families we were trying to feed that day. Um, but it all depend, depended on the size of the parking lot. And if it was a huge parking lot, you could get everybody in all at once. But if it was a small parking lot, well, you're, you've got traffic out on the street and it just becomes more, more chaotic. Yeah. Um, but I mean, we could do, there were some distributions where we could get three to 400 families in a, in a matter of an hour and a half to two hours. Holy cow. And, and we just had, so, so part of it is just managing the flow of traffic. Um, if you can't get the, the cars in quick enough, then obviously that, that's going to slow down your, your production numbers. Um, but how many times did you run out of food and did you ever run out of food? Uh, there, there were some where we would run out of food, um, and, and we would, we, most of the time we were able to get it where if we ran out of food, the car sat in line for about 10 minutes before the, the next truck showed up with more food. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and normally we could tell like, okay, Hey, there's another 20 cars in line and we've only got, you know, half a pallet of, you know, let's say the veggie boxes, uh, you know, there's only half a pallet left. That's going to be it. Okay, we need we need another pallet of this, another pallet of this, and then we would get another truck to bring more food out for us. And and most of the time, we had it resupplied within ten minutes of actually running out. And, and those were on on busy days. Uh, most days, you know, we even if we were close to running out, we could get it resupplied uh, before we actually ran out. Wow, that's talk about just in time delivery. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah okay. lot, lots of lots of communication in real time and, and being able to adjust. How many how many um uh I had my question, hang on a minute. When you're looking at, at at the number of people you've got in line, how many times did the people say what kind of reaction did you get from people in line? I mean, there must have been a relief. It must have been it must have been gratitude or what was it like so there there were a lot i'd, I'd say a vast majority like like 90 percent of the people coming through were were grateful for for the food that they were getting um and and were grateful for the service members being out there uh providing that that service um you know, there there were a few that came through that were less than happy, um, and and I don't know. And this is one of the things that I that I told all my all my guys and gals working under me was, you know, you don't know what their life story is. Yeah. They might come through, and they they might be pissed about something. Whether they're going through a divorce, they just lost their job. You know, maybe their their one of their parents just died from COVID. One of their parents just died from cancer. We don't know their life story, and everyone has a backstory. And just because they're pissed off doesn't mean they're pissed off at you. It's a great and, point. 
And whether they're pissed off or not, if they're there because they need food, well, they still need food. You know, just just because you're not a nice person doesn't mean you're not in need. Yeah. And and so there was some where you know it was it was a hard pill to swallow. Uh, there there was you know you, usually less than than one per distribution that we were at. Uh, but I mean, there was there was a couple times where you know someone would come through and they'd be they'd be upset about something and they would make death threats against us it's like i mean we're just here giving you free food but okay i'm sorry you feel that way here's your food please leave wow um how many how many and, times did you have did you have, did you see tears in the eyes of people getting the food say that again how many times did you see people with tears in their eyes when they got the food oh uh, at least once a distribution um, in fact, there, there was, there was one that I, that I was at, um, and that, that was a day we had four different sites going on at the same time. Uh, and so I moved from, from one site to the other and, and I got there and there was a, a guy that had already, uh, come through and gotten food from us. It, it was at a, a library in Toledo. Um, he had already gotten his food. When I pulled into the parking lot, he was sitting at a picnic table over outside the library. The library was closed, so he couldn't actually go in. Um, and he came back over and, and you know, as he was, as he was walking up, I walked over to him and, and started talking to him. And he says, Hey, I already came through and, and got food. I just wanted to come back and say, thank you. And he starts telling me a story. He was living out of his car. He, and this was this was probably late June, maybe early July. Um, and so obviously a, a few months into the into the pandemic, he lost his job the first week of the pandemic. Um, and he was so he couldn't afford his uh, rent payment each month. So he was evicted from his apartment didn't have food, didn't have a job, and he was literally living out of his car. Wow. And, and he had no idea that that was the first time he had gotten food from us. And he had no idea that the food bank was doing this. Wow. And he came up and, and I mean, not just a tear in his, in his eye, but tears. Wow. He was bawling his eyes out, telling the story. Holy cow. And, and you could tell that he meant every single word of gratitude that he expressed. Wow. And, and I, I mean, I can't tell you whether or not there was, you know, any exaggeration or embellishment in his story, but I, I had no doubt that he was grateful with, with every ounce of his being. You could you could just tell that this guy was having a hard go of it. Wow. And and you know I I still remember very vividly that encounter. And and that's one that you know even even the days when you know someone's being a jerk, we give them free food and they still want to threaten our lives. It, we're we're out there because that guy needs help. Yeah. And you never know when that right. guy's at. And, and, and he spent his day sitting outside the library online looking for jobs. He wasn't just trying to take advantage of the extra $600, you know, a week for, for unemployment for losing his job during COVID. He, he was actively looking, looking to get back to work and getting himself back up on his feet. Wow. But there, there was just nothing available for him, and and we were able to be there on on a day when he was there just by pure coincidence. He had no idea that the the food bank was going out and doing distributions. Holy cow! And, and you know, I I don't think I'll ever forget his story. I certainly won't. 
This is part of the, this is part of the pandemic that we don't know about. This is you know that's why that's why it's this is getting this word out is so critical because you know many people complain we got to wear a mask or you know my my favorite bar is not open, but there are people out there such as this person that this affected them so deeply, and so many families yeah. were affected by this. Yeah. It's incredible. Um, yeah, it, and I think I mean when you know when COVID stuff first started being talked about whether you know whether it was a hoax or, or whether it was real you know i i personally have had covid i was diagnosed back around thanksgiving time i, I had it it wasn't fun uh i i had it the test came back positive so i'm i'm convinced it's real but even even for the people that don't think covid is real I can tell you with absolute certainty that the second and third order effects that have caused pain and suffering, whether joblessness, homelessness, food insecurity, you know, not being able to see family, the pain and suffering that come along with those aspects of life are very real. Yeah. So even if you don't think the disease itself is real, it, it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to figure out that people are in pain and suffering. I agree with you. And, and this project has really shown me that big time. Um, how many, so at your peak, I, mean, I, I, I don't know if it's still, if you're still having many main distribution centers that you have now. I mean, is, did it, has it peaked? Is it winding down or is it the same level of demand? Uh, I, it, it's hard to tell. Uh, back at, at Thanksgiving and Christmas time, uh, we definitely did see some some higher numbers than what we've seen uh, previously in the year. Um, but I think that that time of year, going into you know Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, people are more willing to admit that they need help, uh, or or they're spending what money they do have on other things like gifts for for loved ones yeah. um and so then since they're spending money on gifts instead of money on food then they say hey yeah i, I need help and they they come through the line and, and get food um so at thanksgiving and christmas time there was definitely an increased need um but i think that the numbers today are comparable with where we were at back in like august september and october time frame okay um now i, I think that might be down I, I, in some ways it's it's down but in other ways it, it's actually up uh from you know april and may time frame right um i i think part of it there there was a larger need back in april and may right you know when when more people weren't going to work during the stay at home period and and businesses were closed down there was people without without income but i think in some ways there was just a lot of people that didn't know they could get food from the food bank yeah because because you're looking back i mean as you said how do you qualify and they don't know that the, the qualifications have been waived they don't know that right well so there's that but then also Right. If I was responsible with the money I made last year, right, and I've got my savings built up, and you know, I, I mean, just as a general rule of thumb, you know, keep at least three months of of income in your savings account. That way, if you lost your job, you have three months to get by before you actually need income again. Mm -hmm. Well, if that was my mentality and I was prepared to go without income for a few months. Well, when those three months go by and I'm still unemployed, I've now burned through my savings. I was trying to be responsible, but I wasn't responsible enough. And, and to no fault of my own, but I've burned through my savings and now I need help. Right? So in July, we might have had a new client that didn't come through the previous months because they were living off their savings. Okay. They could afford food up until that point. I see. So, so there's there there was a heightened need just because of the immediate lots of people out of work during the stay at home period. Uh, but then, 
later into the summer and even into the fall, still new clients just because, you know, they lived off their savings for, for a few months or, or just didn't know that they could get food from the food bank yet. And, and there's still people out there that need food. And I, I think that a better comparison would be how many people qualified and, and needed food pre pandemic versus how many need it now. And, and the numbers are just through the roof. Wow. Um, what would you, what would you like to, I don't want to keep you on this one, Michael, you've been so tremendous with this. When someone looks at your, at your artwork, what would you want them to walk away with? What, what kind of impact do you want to have them leave with when they go to, when they, when they see your, your artwork? Oh gosh, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, I don't know. It, it, the pandemic for me has been uh, a period of mixed emotions, right? I've, I've seen, you know, the, the gentleman outside the library that was, I mean, down to a, a prayer and a hope and, and just absolutely needed assistance and, and was so grateful. And I've seen people pissed off just because we were soldiers and airmen, right? And they couldn't look past the fact that we were helping them. So I've seen, you know, the heart wrenching, you know, tear jerking, you know, I, I need help stories. And I've seen the, I'm an angry person. I hate you just because you're you stories. But I also see the service members that, that have put in their time and energy into serving their community and the commitment and the dedication that, you know, despite the risk of being exposed to the virus, going out and, and seeing a thousand people in a day, face to face, obviously wearing masks, we're wearing gloves, you know, we're trying to social distance while we're loading food into their cars, but to go out into public and, and put themselves at risk to be around other people that we don't we're, I mean, we weren't checking everyone's temperature as they came through the line. They were staying in the car. We, we, you know, we had minimal contact with them, but we're still putting ourselves at risk. Yeah. Right. And, and whether you're going home to your family or in fact, we had, we had soldiers that, that didn't live local to the food bank they were working in and they were in a hotel. Some of them lived in a hotel room for six months. Wow. Right. So just to not be home for that long. Wow. <laughs> right. Most people don't like staying in a hotel room for more than three nights. And, and we had soldiers that sacrificed their, you know, comfy living condition in their apartment or their home or spending time with family to go work at a, at a food bank to help people to serve their community. You know, you made a, you made a, a tremendous statement there when you said that these, these, these soldiers and these airmen serve their community versus being trained to defend it. You know, there's a big difference between defending a community and serving it. When you defend it, you're on the perimeter and you're looking at the bad guys. When you're serving it, you're amongst them, helping them, helping them through it. And that's, that's a, a bit, I mean, I'm just guessing it is, Michael, but that's a big difference between those two. Oh, yeah, abs absolutely. Right. I mean, now, now, Brad, you know, there, there's plenty of sayings out there about, you know, when, when fighting a war, it, it's not so much about hating the enemy in front of you, but the people behind you loving them so much that you're willing to fight for them. Right. It's not that you want to fight the guy in front of you, but you want to fight for the people behind you. Right. Well, this is an opportunity, and, and kind of like you just said, it's an opportunity to not fight for the people that's behind us, but to actually be with part of the people behind us and to serve them. Um, and, and it's just a totally different 
uh, arena, right? We we normally focus more overseas. I mean, sure, the National Guard gets called up for you know riot control, that kind of stuff, but our primary focus is is outward, overseas, out of the country. Yeah. And here and, you're, you're seeing the faces of the people that you defend. I mean, it's 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 a unique yeah. opportunity to see the people that you defend and. And, and, you know, how much, and granted, not all of them are appreciative, as you have mentioned, but still you get a chance to see them. You know, you get to look inward this time instead of outward, which is an unusual situation. Wow, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, and I think, I mean, sure, you know, when you watch commercials and you see the, the National Guard advertisement and it's, you know, hey, join the National Guard and, and serve your community. You know, I've, I've been in, uh, this April will be 11 years. Um, so in fact, when I, when I came on mission, I had just hit my, my 10 year mark and not once have I been activated within the States. Wow. Holy and cow. So I, was, I was in theoretically halfway to retirement, right? 20 years to retire, halfway to retirement and had never deployed within the States. There was a, a couple times where I almost got called up for either riot control or hurricane relief. But, you know, like hurricane relief, it's typically, at least here in Ohio, it's not typically serving your own community. Right, exactly. Right. It's, it is serving on the national level your community, but it's not like, hey, I live 10 minutes down the street from where I'm working right now kind of community. Exactly, exactly. And, and I mean, I, I live about an hour from Toledo and have, have worked most of my time on active duty this year out of Toledo, um, but it's still it's still part of my my community, right? It's Northwestern Ohio. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, I, I don't think I've said this yet. Back in July, I moved up uh, to the task force leadership level, uh, and now oversee the food bank I was at in Toledo, plus a second food bank in Toledo, and a food bank in Lima. Um, so I, I have a little bit more territory that I cover now, and I oversee all of the service members working between all of the, those three food banks. Um, and I, I just know, you know, some of them were, you know, they lost their job when the, when the pandemic started and, and they said, sure. I just lost my job. I can either stay home and do nothing or I can go serve my community. And they, they jumped on the opportunity to then give back. Wow. Right. And I, I think one of the other, the other tremendous parts of, of this mission for us is countless times. If, if you know, you're an educator or you're an employer, you, if you've had a, a National Guardsman or a National Guardswoman in your either classroom or place of employment, we are constantly asking, hey, will you excuse this soldier from work so they can go train? Right. Will you excuse this soldier from class so they can go train? And then a deployment comes up. And will you excuse this soldier, not just miss one day of work, but miss one year of work or miss one year of class to deploy. And, and we are constantly asking for the community to sacrifice for us so that we can go do what we need to do. Right. And this mission has been an opportunity for us to say, you know what, you've supported us. Now let us support you. What a tremendous, tremendous viewpoint. <clears throat> That's the, I never even thought about that, Michael. Right. So, so the community has given everything to us. Right. And, and I mean, especially, you know, Memorial Day or Veterans Day celebrations, July 4th, right. Almost every single town does something to, to commemorate their, their service members, whether active duty, National Guard, reserves, Army, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, Navy, you know, in some way, almost every single community even, even the small towns, the small rural towns have some sort of, you know, veteran acknowledgement 
support system. And, and whether it's coming home from a deployment or, you know, coming off of active duty, you know, after however many years and, and coming back to town, you know, there, there has been consistent support from all of our communities. And now we're able to go back into our communities and say, you were there for me, now I'm here for you. That's a fantastic viewpoint. Truly. And, and that's, that's probably been one of my, my favorite parts of the mission. Uh, the, the church that I go to in Tiffin, First Lutheran Church over on Melmore Street, is a host site for one of the distributions from the West Ohio Food Bank in Lima. To be able to show up the third Thursday of every month, or excuse me, fourth Thursday of every month, at, at the parking lot, at the church I go to, and stand stand in the line giving out food amongst other soldiers and airmen, but also with other people that go to my church with me, right? Standing in my community to be able to give food to the people that live in that community. Wow. Wow. And and I know they they've been supportive of me. Um, in, in fact, uh, that church, I, I lost my full-time job a year before the pandemic. Uh, and, and just to help make ends meet, uh, it just so happened that my church was hiring a janitor and I was looking for a part-time job. So they hired me. Well, when I had drill, you know, no, no questions asked, no hesitation. Yep. You have an obligation. Go ahead. We'll, we'll make sure everything that needs done gets done. Right. And even being on, on this mission, they've said, don't worry about it. We'll find somebody to cover it for you. And they have been supportive of me. So to now be able to go back and work alongside them in a different capacity, uh, serving the community has, has just been phenomenal for me. It uh, had to be because, you know, especially because you're, you're amongst them. You know, and, and you're, you're, you're not in the congregation, you're in the parking lot. You're in the congregation, but you're not. You're in the, you're in the parking lot yes. and, and you're running the show. And they see you working what you've been trained to do. They see you what you, you know, when you leave for drill, granted it's not the same thing, but they see you, you know, leaving to, to serve your country and now they see you serve your country. It had to be, it had to be tremendous for them as well. It had to be. Yeah. Wow. And, and so to, to go back to your, your question of, what I hope someone would get or take away from looking at the artwork. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not even sure if, if this is a great way to describe what I'm thinking, but the give and take of a support system, the, the relationship between being supported and then supporting. Yeah. Um, and, and really every relationship, whether marriage, friendship, you know, employer, employee relationship, there's always a give and take. And, and there are times, you know, I, I mean, especially like in a marriage, there are times when one spouse needs supported and the other spouse needs to support. And then there's times when it, flip, it flips the other way and the other spouse needs supported and the other spouse turns and, and gives the support. And, and I think the, the, this mission supporting the, the food banks, having been supported by the community and now being able to support the community is, is just a, a tremendous role reversal. And, and if, if the artwork could capture that and someone could walk away somehow with that kind of, uh, feeling of, of mutual support uh that that's what i would would want i think you just did it michael i think you just did it tremendous michael thank you for the story this is exactly what i wanted to hear i need to get an insight from from you on what the pandemic was like because or what is the pandemic like because i had no idea i had no idea wow Michael, I'll let you know as yeah. things progress. 
And uh, I'll, you know, we're gonna sign artists here as we go. I'll keep you posted as to the times and dates, but May 18th from noon to two is, is the uh, official date right now. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push that in. If you can't um, make it, I'm sure if you, you get the artwork anyway sometime in that week, but if you, if you can make it, it'd be fantastic. I'd love to have you there. Okay, May 18th. Uh, d d what time did you say? Noon to two. Noon to two. Okay, and you said that's at the Ritz? At the Ritz, yeah. Everyone will get invites because I'm going to make them up, but yeah. I want to get a chance to get to it right now. All right, I got it in my calendar. Perfect. Michael, once again, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for all the things that you do and give my best to the family, okay? Yeah, will do. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, Michael. See ya. Yep, see you. Bye-bye.